Hey everyone, ever wondered where I get the piles of MacBooks and other stuff on my channel? It's from electronics recyclers. Buying from recyclers has been the basis of my business for the last 15 years, so if you want to know how to do it, this is the video to watch. This is an update to a pretty popular video I did a few years ago. A lot has changed, so I wanted to make a new version. So to start, what is an electronics recycler? To put it simply, it's a place where government corporations and schools dump their electronics when they're done with them. Many also take donations from the general public. There are maybe a few thousand in the US and they're all around the country and they're generally pretty low profile and located in rural areas. They're giant warehouses, usually privately owned businesses, and some are for-profit and some are non-profit. It's worth noting that the word recycling means scrapping. It means destruction. There's a lot of confusion with this, and people often have their definitions mixed up. Recycling is the breaking down of electronics into component material like metal and batteries and circuit boards, and selling those off so they can be reprocessed and made into new products. Recycling is different from reuse, which means to repair, refurbish, and put back into the world so it can live on in its current form. It's very important to understand Understand the difference because most people say recycling when they mean reuse and the greenwashers of the world take advantage of that. Recyclers do like to sell for reuse when it's financially viable and when practical, but due to many constraints they often end up recycling most material. They're called recyclers after all, and they have giant shredding machines, and they have what I like to call disassembly lines, where stuff comes in and it's taken apart, and parts are put into giant open face boxes called Gaylord boxes, which sit on top of pallets, and which are loaded into trucks and sold to other parties. So there's recycling, there's reuse, and the third general term, sort of an informal term, is to landfill, which means just that, to dump it. This is what happens when you put something in the trash. You put electronics in the trash instead of taking it to the recycler, it'll probably end up in a landfill. That's not good. Electronics should always be reused if possible, and worst case, they should end up at a recycler for recycling. Electronics recyclers, to their credit, do try at least to recycle all material, and they generally don't landfill. Due to the cost of recycling, though, the majority of recyclable material out there still does end up in the landfill, unfortunately. Recyclers are an absolute paradise of electronics. They get massive amounts of computers, phones, gadgets of all types, crazy stuff you never knew existed, more than they could ever sort and test and sell appropriately. There's enough random material coming through any given recycler to support hundreds of small refurbishing businesses. We produce too much stuff in this world, and we dump electronics at alarming rates, and what you see at recyclers is a complete absurdity, honestly, the result of unapologetically rampant consumerism. So yeah, it's just an impossibility that all working items could ever get reused because there's just too much volume. There's simply not enough people to put in enough labor to make it all work. I like to think of recyclers as a game of Tetris. You have a giant space, a warehouse, you have a manager responsible for that space, and large objects are constantly coming in and filling it up. The manager's job is to make the Tetris pieces disappear, either by scrapping them, selling for reuse, or other means, but the main thing is the clock is ticking and it all needs to go one way or the other. Therefore, the way to make yourself useful to recyclers is to present yourself as a specialist who can help them out. For example, I market myself as the Mac guy. If the red Tetris pieces coming in represented Macs, for example, my strategy is to tell them, hey, I'm here to help you with all the red pieces. Anything red you get, I'll take it, and I'll take it quickly and efficiently, and I won't pay you much, but I will be very efficient at helping you play the game and removing those red chunks. Now, when you present yourself as a specialist like this, it's very, very important to stay true to your word and to take all of what falls under your specialty when they call you. That's because, essentially, you are the trash person for that particular thing. Imagine if you hired a trash service for your house and you realized they were only taking half the trash and leaving the rest scattered all around your yard. That would be pretty annoying, wouldn't it? And what would you do? Obviously, you'd sign up another trash service, and if they did the job, you wouldn't call the first person back. That's how recyclers work. You need to be 100% reliable picking up all the trash all the time, and that gets them addicted to using you, because you're not their customer. You're a service provider helping them play the game and making their jobs easier. 
If you demand that they break the red Tetris pieces into a hundred smaller pieces, and then you say you'll only buy a few of the small pieces and make them deal with the mess you've left, then guess what? They won't be interested in dealing with you again. That's what you're doing if you show up asking to buy only one or two computers and, oh, by the way, they need to have certain specs, etc. They'll just throw you out the door. The cool thing is, though, by buying all with a recycler, you have leverage and you can often get amazing prices because they're motivated by the fact that you're solving their problem and taking everything. Most likely, the person you're dealing with isn't the owner. They're just some disgruntled employee tasked with clearing the place out. So they want it gone more than they care about price. Efficiency on your part is more valuable to them than money. If you understand the dynamics of this counterintuitive relationship, that as the buyer you are the service provider, and as the seller they are the customer, then you'll do well. Most people don't grasp this though, and they expect buying from a recycler is like driving down to Target and picking up a few things, and it just isn't. As you may guess, while recyclers are a bargain on a per item basis, we're talking about lots of material so it can get very expensive, like thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. If that bothers you, you should really get your feet wet first buying and selling on eBay instead. But if you're determined to be a real business, this is the type of money you have to deal with. I'm not one to advocate debt, but it's easy to pay recyclers with PayPal. And PayPal lets you link a credit card so you can pay on credit. You better know that you're being profitable before you take on that kind of risk, but it's a way to get inventory when you don't have liquid cash. And once you've got a recycler calling you, the worst thing you can do is say no to a trash pickup. People ask me all the time, how do you determine the prices to pay? Well, my number one rule is never pay more than you can sell it for broken. Recyclers don't know the condition their stuff is in, and if they say they do, don't trust that, because believe me, they don't know, they're just guessing. You're buying as is, and you should expect it's all broken, and price it accordingly. That way, if it is broken, you're still in good shape because you got a mountain of repairable goods that you got for next to nothing. The good part here is, most likely at least some of it is working, so that puts you way ahead of your projection. I have to say, paying more than a broken price is nothing short of gambling, really. And successful businesses don't gamble, they bet on sure things. And besides, you don't want to go back to the recycler complaining that it's not what they claimed. When the trash person complains, the trash person doesn't get called back. So back to the question, how do you know how to price it? Well, first consider that the scrap value of a laptop to a recycler is somewhere around $8. That means if they just scrap it instead of selling it to you, the component parts like metal and board and battery are worth about $8 to them. So don't offer less than that because you're insulting them and it shows you don't know what you're doing. A good rule of thumb for old material is two to three times scrap value. Of course, there are different circumstances and if these are nearly new computers, the price will go up. One thing I always say is don't bid. The highest bidder is always a sucker as a general rule. They pay too much. Lots of recyclers have email lists they send notice of inventory to and they sell to the highest bidder, but you really don't want that. What you want is a direct relationship where they call you immediately and you're the only one making the offer. I can't say it strongly enough. It is imperative to buy at the right prices. You don't make money when you sell. You make money when you buy. That's because the price at which you sell is fairly predictable. You can go on eBay and figure out what things sell for, but the price you buy at there can be a lot of fluctuation there, especially when you're talking about broken or incomplete material. If you buy too high, it's the worst thing you can do because then you'll have to spend time and effort, days or even weeks, to make your money back with little profit, no profit, or even a loss. When you pay too much, the profit margin window just disappears. So make sure to turn down anything that doesn't fit your calculation. Just say no to prices that don't work. It'll be uncomfortable at times, but what's even more uncomfortable is spending weeks working for virtually no money because you paid too much. Eventually you'll find the right recyclers and you'll kind of lock in at the right prices and it won't be so much of an issue, but you have to get there first. To give you an example, as a general rule, I don't do anything unless I double my money. So if the going price for a computer is $100 and I'm buying them broken, I would never pay more than, say, $15. That's because assuming they're all broken, conservatively I probably need three broken ones to build one working computer. So if you figure three broken ones are $45 and three broken ones equal one working computer, then that's less than half the sale price and it allows me to double my money. 
And like I say, always be conservative about it because then reality is always better than your estimate and you're always safe. Maybe you get a good lot that's mostly working or all working and that's when your calculation really pays off. So the thing that's really important to understand is that all of this is very, very hard. These relationships are not easy to come by. Again, you're not just walking into a target. I went to a sales training decades ago and the teacher taught us something I will always remember that if you make a hundred cold calls and drop those hundred into a funnel, then maybe, just maybe, you will have a chance to make one sale and one sale will drop out of the bottom of that funnel. So it's hard, much more work than you would think. Now with that in mind, there are two types of people. One type hears about the funnel and gives up, thinks it's too much work, maybe makes a few calls, fails, and decides it's impossible. The other kind of person gets super excited because they realize success is possible. They just need to make a thousand cold calls to maybe get 10 orders, and that person's off to the races. As they say, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right, because both these people are correct based on the arguments they're convincing themselves of but really it's all a matter of attitude. Hopefully you're the kind of person who sees the opportunity because it really is worth it. And once you establish a relationship with a recycler, it can pay off infinitely and get you millions of dollars worth of material over many years. So next question, how do you find these recyclers and get in the door? Because honestly, they're pretty hidden. They keep to themselves in industrial areas. They don't have inviting public storefronts or even allow public access. It sounds odd, but of the hundreds of recyclers I've dealt with, I've found the vast, vast majority of them on eBay. That's because, to put it simply, if a recycler is desperate enough to sell on eBay and do all the work required to sell individual items, then what that means is they don't have a dedicated service provider for that Tetris piece. It's an admission of that, essentially, and it allows you a window to step in and try to be that person. So here's my technique. I search eBay for MacBook lot, or you can search for any given thing. When you find a listing with say 10 broken MacBooks, that's a good chance it's a recycler because who else has 10 MacBooks? You can click on other items, and if it generally looks like recycler material, then it's probably a recycler. If the only other things they're selling are used t-shirts, then probably not. The names also give it away. They have very generic, boring recycler names, dynamic recycling, innovative disposal solutions, nonsense like that. Some call themselves ITAD, I-T-A-D, and ITAD is a recycler that also tries to refurbish the devices they get. They're generally pretty bad at it, honestly, because refurbishing is an entirely different business than recycling. But if you see reference to ITAD, that's basically a recycler. Okay, so you've identified a recycler of the thing you're interested in. Next, you make a deal. Hopefully, they're selling what you want at the right price. Maybe you make an offer. Remember to only pay what it's worth broken. But the point is, you make a deal, you buy something, you get it, see if it's what you want and right for your business. If you bought it at the right price and it's good material, the next step is to message the recycler through eBay and say something like this. The ideal thing that can happen at this point is that you get in touch outside of eBay, you become their service provider for the products you buy, and you live happily ever after. But realistically, this is only one cold call dropped into the funnel. Most likely, you won't get a response. If you do, they might give you bad news, or they might say they'll be in touch, but you never hear back again. But with persistence and with hundreds of cold calls dropped into the funnel, you'll eventually make connections. You don't actually have to buy something from them to send a message. But doing that does demonstrate credibility and makes them more likely to listen. So people always ask, but John, don't you want recyclers near you? Isn't the technique less efficient because often you end up dealing with recyclers around the country? There is this idea out there that local is better, but I've found that often it just isn't. If you find a recycler 20 miles away, it can take all day to drive there, pick it up, take the stuff home, unload. Whereas if a recycler ships to you, it shows up on your doorstep. They all have freight shipping accounts, so they can easily ship pallets. If you don't have a loading dock, you can pick up at the local freight center. I'm not knocking local, it can be a very good situation as well, but I've had as much success with stuff across the country as local. And because these relationships are so hard to establish, you wanna take what you can get without being picky. 
One trick is that you can also benefit from using prepaid shipping labels. You can email recyclers a dozen FedEx labels and they can just print them out, tape them to the box and hand them to FedEx. This gets you lots of leverage because many recyclers primarily do freight and they don't want to mess with small carriers. Okay, so up to now I've been painting a pretty rosy picture, right? But unfortunately these days, reality is that buying from recyclers and the overall scene for refurbishing products in general has been getting lots, lots harder. The recycling industry has tightened up and the technology itself has become less amenable to refurbishing and reuse in a number of ways. I'll just summarize the problems that are going on because there's so much to say, but if you want to know more, you can watch my other videos that go into far more detail. First, electronics recycling certifications have become more prominent, certifications like R2, which stands for Responsible Recycling. These limit who the recyclers can sell to, and the limitations are mostly due to data destruction concerns and liability paranoia, things like that. In the old days, recyclers would simply pull the hard drives out of computers and deal with those separately and then sell you the computers without drives. But these days, the data is part of the logic board. It's not removable, so it's not that easy. Recyclers just don't trust refurbishers to deal with the data, and they don't do it themselves either because the certification requirements for wiping are just too harsh. So that causes devices to get scrapped out of laziness and lack of time. Or they take the boards out and scrap the boards and then offer you boardless laptops, which are pretty useless. This goes for things like phones and tablets as well. Anything with data that is not removable is at risk of being scrapped. To make matters worse, another problem is software locks like Apple activation lock and remote management locks. These turn devices into unusable bricks that can't effectively be refurbished at all. Activation lock is marketed as a security feature and most people believe locked devices are all stolen, but that is typically not the case. Most devices become locked when institutions dumping to recyclers don't bother to reset them first because they assume they're going to be destroyed or they're just lazy. And so recyclers end up with thousands of unusable devices and no leverage to push back on suppliers. Similarly, institutions register devices with remote management tools uh, called MDM, Mobile Device Management, or DEP, Device Enrollment Protocol. And because they don't bother to deregister them from the system when they dump them, the device perpetually prompts the user for a login that they don't have, which effectively bricks the machine. And just when you think it can't get worse, companies like Apple are implementing parts pairing, which means components of a device are cryptographically tied to one another. So if you swap out a bad screen with a perfectly good used screen, for example, the computer rejects it because it doesn't consider it a match, and it therefore shows errors or certain features won't work, which makes the device unsellable on the market. This is obviously catastrophic because refurbishers need to be able to use good parts to do repair, and Apple won't pair used parts. They'll only pair brand new parts you buy directly from them, which are priced too high to be viable in a refurbishing situation. So yeah, that means all used Apple parts are junk. The right to repair movement is trying to change this and it's making some headway, but it's a struggle and we don't know how it's going to end up. So between the certifications clamping down, the embedded storage, the software locks, and parts pairing, it's becoming a very grim situation in the world of refurbishing. It's still possible, but every day presents another depressing thing we have to worry about. I will say, one benefit of the eBay route I describe is that certified recyclers are very reluctant to sell on eBay, so with my method you'll often find the uncertified ones that are still willing to sell to you, whereas big certified recyclers probably won't give you the time of day at this point. If you do deal with certified recyclers, your best bet is to show them that you are super professional and that you have a formal data destruction process that is compliant with their certifications. That won't necessarily help, but if they are really motivated to sell to you, it can. So what can you do in light of all this? Well, basically, all these problems call for new strategies. Probably the best strategy is to get the material before the recyclers do, go straight to the donating schools and corporations. Again, it's not easy, and you'll have a lot of doors slammed in your face, but it is possible. 
My friend Coco, who goes by Coco the Geek, is an Atlanta refurbisher who has been very successful building a reputation on Nextdoor and other social networks. She basically establishes herself as the go-to company in her area to contact when people have electronics they don't want. She's been so successful doing that and gotten so many donations that she's now able to specialize in audio equipment. Other people I know have had success paying retail stores to allow them to keep electronics drop boxes in their locations, in their lobbies. Personally, I have a website where consumers can sell their computers to me directly. It doesn't get a ton of business, but when it does, it's usually good stuff. And also, Facebook Marketplace is increasingly becoming an eBay replacement, so it's important to keep an eye on that too. I've used Marketplace to find many large lots in rural areas that others weren't willing to drive to. These are all ways around the recycling situation that will become more and more important in the future. I haven't given up on recyclers, and they still represent the majority of my material, but if I had to make a suggestion as to strategy at this point, I would say to implement all of the above techniques. In other words, don't limit yourself. Some options will shrink with time, others will grow, so it's important to be exploring them all. Redundancy in all aspects of your business is difficult, but it's important. That way, when one thing disappears, you're not completely screwed. One other final aspect I want to touch on, my previous video on this topic prompted many people around the world to contact me, and the biggest question from them was, well, where are the recyclers in my country? I don't seem to have recyclers here. And reality is, different countries deal with electronics differently. In the UK and the EU, for example, it turns out it's literally law in most cases that any electronics that enter the doors of a recycler must be scrapped. So unfortunately, if you live there, then my technique won't work for you at all. And you'll have to focus on getting the goods before they go through those, those doors of death, so to speak. It's pretty sad, really. The EU has such a good reputation for environmentalism on the surface, but the reality is they're scrapping everything and the entire population has been fooled because they don't understand that recycling is not reuse. That's what we call greenwashing. So we're getting to the end here. I want to say the best thing I ever did, honestly, was to start my business. It gave me independence, and for 15 years I've made a good living doing the greenest thing possible, taking discarded material and putting it back into the world. It's good for the environment and for everyone, for me, the recyclers, thousands of people who ultimately get a good deal on a used device. A small business is like a heart pumping blood through the economy, and that's a good thing. In the U.S. alone, there's enough used and broken material to be the basis for tens of thousands of businesses like mine. And the way I see it, repair and refurbishing of this type is really the best possible method to combat the ever-growing pile of junk we create. There are so many people talking and talking about environmental issues and how they can be solved with one approach or another, but nothing ever changes. You know, actually starting a business like this is one thing that you can do that actually makes a difference right now. There's that cheesy saying, be the change you want to see in the world, right? Well, this is the change. You can improve yourself, you can make a living, you can save thousands of devices from destruction, and you can save people money by providing a viable product. It's a win-win, and it's the greenest thing you can do. Like it or not, the most effective tool we have in our capitalist society is commerce, which is money. If we knock on enough doors, if recyclers know we will pay serious money for their stuff, if we can make it make sense for them in terms of money, then that's what's going to compel them, and that's what's going to get the wheels turning in the right direction. So that's it, really. It's crazy to think, but doing repair and refurbishing is to be an activist by default, because by default you have to deal with and object to all the issues that are out there. And simply by doing what you're doing, it educates others. I can't tell you how many people I've seen get completely blown away when they buy a $100 MacBook and realize it does everything they need. It absolutely changes their minds forever about their attitude towards buying new versus used. Refurbishing and reuse is definitely the best option for the future of used electronics. For the sake of everyone's future, I hope it doesn't get shut off by the wall of adversity and apathy that seems to be ever encroaching. It's not going to be easy to keep that pathway open. We need to constantly push back, we need to be innovative and adapt, and most of all, we need to be relentlessly good salespeople for the cause. We need to have faith that if we keep dropping a hundred attempts into that funnel, out of the bottom, we'll still find a future. Thanks for listening.